Thank you. Go get them. <coughs> Thank you, Emmett. Uh, it's been a lot, a lot of years we've traveled around and done a lot of meetings together. Um, going, I remember our one trip where we started in eastern Tennessee and spent four days having two meetings a day all the way across to the western border. But anyway, um, I'm David Trowbridge. I'm, uh, I'm the manager at Gregory Feedlots. Uh, Emmett said uh, they either customers get unhappy with you or they, the owners. I've survived that, but I've never had anybody offer me big money to go somewhere else. So <laughs> that, that, that's the one thing I've been looking for, but I haven't got that. Um, I'll give you a little bit on Gregory Feedlots. We're a 7,000 head uh, commercial feedlot. We feed about 90% of our cattle the last 10 years anyway have been uh, custom fed cattle. We've been fortunate enough to uh, be able to retain order, uh, retain customers and and keep them in our system to keep our feedlot full of cattle without owning a lot of cattle. Um, it does make for a complicated life because you're dealing with 60 to 70 different customers all the time and trying to keep everybody happy and we all know in the cattle business we're not always making money and we're not always uh, got a good situation where we have healthy cattle all the time. But uh, Jeff invited me to come here and, uh, and speak to you guys uh, on what's changed in the last 20 years in, in uh, the cattle feeding industry and the relationship between uh, your, your industry, your part of the industry and, our, and my part of the industry. Um, I'm not, uh, I'm not a great speaker. I'm a, I'm a lot better standing out in the lot and kicking the dirt and talking to you when uh, I've got some cattle standing around. So uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll, uh, I'd be glad to answer them at any time. And there's always seems to be a lot of questions for feedlot managers. Uh, you guys have, uh, the two earlier speakers, uh, Dr. Strickland and Dr. Yaz, have done a great job. Of filling you in with the intellectual stuff. Now we'll talk about the abstract stuff in the in the cattle business. Now, um, one of the things uh, that I, I want to stress is, you know, what's changed in the industry in the in the last forty years that I've been in it a lot. I mean, tremendous amount. And in the last twenty years, it's changed even faster. And I believe that in the next ten years, it's going to change much more. Uh, all all segments of the industry are going to change dramatically in the next in the next few years. Um, the the important question is what has changed in your as stockers uh, cow calf producers? What's changed in your marketing relationship to to the feedlots or the the uh, marketers that buy your calves? That's really what has changed. We all know that. What Dr. Strickland and Dr. Yaz are talking about, and the, and the vaccination vaccination programs, all feedlots want the same thing. We want healthy cattle that have been vaccinated, weaned. They're going to gain better than nor than average. They're going to they're going to yield and grade better than average, and they're going to be profitable. That hasn't changed in 40 years. We're all very interested in that, and we're that is a big part of what you guys do and that's a big part of what the entire uh, beef industry relies on is for the cow-calf segment and the stalker segment to produce those kind of animals for the feedlot industry and that has not changed. I, we, uh, I was talking to someone earlier here, we have better drugs, we have better vaccinations, we have a lot of things going on there that are so much better than they were when we started. But if you look at the industry today in the feedlot industry, our percent pulls in the feedlot industry is exactly the same as it was 40 years ago. Our death loss in the feedlots are the same as they were 40 years ago. We have very little change in that, but we have a, we have a lot better um, products to use on those cattle. And you guys have a lot more input uh, in that also. Um, a lot of a lot of the reason for that is we're asking a lot more for the cattle, from the cattle, than we were asking for them 20 years ago. 
um, as far as they're younger, they're bigger, they're, <coughs> there's just a lot of things different that we're pushing them. We sell a lot of 13, 14 month old cattle that weigh 1,300 pounds. We could not do that 20 years ago. So th th those things have changed. So I think the, the big thing that we have to look at today uh, as far as your relationship to your to where your market is and whether your your profitability is how you're going to make money because that's the bottom line in this industry we have very small margins and we're, we're all trying to make a living um, and we love the we have a great passion for our industry and we do with this because of uh, of our passion most of us don't do this because of the money that we're making to to uh, um, build a big a big bank account, but I I do believe that your relationship to me and to to whoever you sell your cattle to is probably the most vital uh, profitability thing that that is is available to, that you need to know today. You need to know where the cattle go when you sell them and what the purpose of that is. I, I tell my I tell my producers all the time, before you buy a bull, decide where your calves are going. What's the purpose of your operation? Before you buy that bull, decide where that calf is going to go, what the purpose of that calf is. And that's going to determine more of your profitability than any of your health programs, your management programs, or anything. Determining where your market is going to be. I, I know that I don't have very many slides here, so I, I, I don't have all that information. But um, you know, in this industry, I'm the past president of the Iowa Cattlemen's, and I've learned more in those two years as as president elect and two years as uh, the president about the cattle industry. I know that in this room right here, I could bring up about four or five topics. And we could split this up by like Republicans and Democrats on different topics and different things that people have opinions on. And the the thing that I I pushed for, for all these years of of being in the leadership was the fact that even though we have divisive issues like if I you bring up traceability or you bring up sustainability, you bring up uh, uh, cool. That's a big hot object, uh, thing right now again. Um, people have different opinions on that, but we're all in the same industry, and we need to we need to uh, be able to compromise and work on those issues and make things work together because we're too small of an industry. We know too many people. I mean, there's actually people here that I know that I've worked with over the years. And I, I can go just about anywhere in the country and run into people that I know that we've worked together in some, in some form because we're such a small entity of people. And we need to work together on all these things. And that's kind of what I, uh, if I push the right button here, that I, uh, I want to go talk about next is in traditional, the segments of the cattle industry, we start out you know, with your seed stock producers. They're producing the genetics that's going to affect all of us for several years every time we buy a, a, some genetics from them. And that greatly affects the cow-calf producer. Then you have the, uh, the backgrounder and the, the grower that next comes around to the feedlot, the packer, and then the consumer. And over the last 40 years, we've had a very adversarial relationship between each one of those. Each one of us is the next guy is trying to steal our money, or they're not producing what we want them to produce, and we've gone we've gone through this whole cycle of uh, of adversarial relationships. And to to really make this all work together, we need to have a relationship between each one of these segments because your relationship with the consumer is much more than you realize. Even as far back as the seed stock producer, it's, that's a huge that's a huge relationship between him and the consumer. Even though he's a long ways from selling them a, a hamburger or a steak, so there's a, there's a there's a connection there. And I like to we all don't want to be the hog industry. We don't want to be vertically integrated because we're all too independent. 
We all have our opinions on everything, and we don't want the next guy telling us what to do. But we have to have some kind of cooperation between us, and I call that cooperative integration, where as a seed stock producer, I can produce a bull that's going to actually produce a better steak for the consumer. And that's, that's the relationship that we have to look at. And I think that's the biggest thing that's changed over the last 20 years. It isn't our, our demands for health, our demands for uh, high quality cattle, our, our demands for a product that can go to the consumer. But I think uh, the thing that's changed the most over the tw last 20 years has been our relationship to each other. How, you know, you know, most feedlot per op managers are, are questionable integrity to, uh, to the cow-calf producer because that's been always been a very uh, adversarial relationship and we're always kind of whether or not the feedlot's really doing their job, job or just trying to get um, more money out of, uh, what, uh, out of the cow-calf producer so that, that I can make money on my end. But um, so that's 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 really the big thing that I, I see is what you as producers need to have knowledge of what your relationship is to the next layer to where you're marketing at. Um, and that's a, and that's a big change. In in my industry, in the in, the, in my segment of the industry. There, there's a lot of gray to white to black in, in the gray area, but we really have two business models in the feeding industry. We have two very distinct business models that operate in today's, in today's industry on the feeding side of things. One of them is the commodity market. And that is the big feedlots, the 100,000 head or you know, all the way down to 30,000 head feedlots that are strictly in the business of running a a feed a hotel. I mean, they're keeping that that hotel full. They're they're operating on small margins. They're they're running uh, and as strictly as a business, and they they don't look at the the producer on your end as as closely as the value added producers. And most of the commodity. Um, Feedlots, you know, this is my definition of them, is they're south and west. That's they're the bigger feedlots. They have more of a corporate image, and they're they're producing huge numbers of cattle on on a contract. In in my area in Iowa, we're we're mainly value added feeders. Very important for us as smaller producers that we have a product that is going to bring back a premium to us. So we're looking at, at animals that have a higher genetic value, have more traceability, more, uh, more uh, opportunity to, to actually make more money per animal than if we're looking in, in a commodity market as a producer. And there's nothing wrong with either one of these. We, we have to have both of them. But, but as far as you're concerned, when we look at these different segments, you know, in, in, the, in the commodity market, it, you're looking at number one thing is predictability. Because the day I buy that calf, wherever I buy it, either on the ranch, in, in a sale barn, or through a, a, a commercial cattle uh, trader, the number one thing is I want there is predictability. Because I'm going to hedge those cattle, I'm going to trade those cattle on the Chicago Board of Trade that day. I'm going to make some kind of deal on those cattle so I know that they're going to go out of my feedlot in 180 days or whatever that, that, day, that time period is. And I know already what I'm going to make, what my possibilities I'm going to make on those cattle. <coughs> so all those cattle are, are judged on a predictable performance basis. They, they, they need to know that they're going to gain three pounds a day or whatever they're predicting three pounds a day, they're going to cost me this much in medicine, I'm going to have this much death loss. There's, there's a formula that they're, they're, they're using for that. 
then that the day that they buy those cattle, they're looking at the Chicago Board of Trade for October, and they're saying I can pay this much money for those cattle. That this is my this is my price. This is what I can pay to to own those cattle that day. Because they're they're looking at all in all out. They buy 200 head of cattle. They put it in a, in a pen. They all go in the same day. They're all going to go out the same day. And so they need predictability. They have a contractor. They have a contract with a packer. So the packer also knows the day that they buy those cattle, that those cattle are going to go to that kill floor that day. They know that. And that is that is the, the predictability that they're looking for. And that's what drives that into that industry. They're looking at very small margins. They're looking at selling feed. They're looking at capacity of the feedlot turnover. They're looking at, at a, as a business model based on, on uh, predictability. Then if we go to uh, the value added into the industry, which you'll see in, in Iowa has big, most of the smaller feedlots in the South Dakota, eastern Nebraska, in Missouri, Illinois, most of your producers are <coughs> What you consider, what I consider to be value added producers. And that is a little different. We're still looking for the same things. We're still looking at for predictability. We're still looking at good health. We're looking at all those same things. But we're looking for quality. That means that every animal that's in our feedlot, and that we're not looking at big as numbers. Like I, I run a 7,000 head feedlot, so we feed somewhere between 10 and 12,000 head of cattle a year that we market. But we're looking at each individual animal as an ability to make a premium for us. Some way to market that animal to get a premium. We look at cattle that are going to grade prime as, as a big draw right now. I, we look at cattle that make CAB premiums. We look at cattle that are going to yield higher. We have we see some difference in genetics on yield. Um, we we sell quite a few Hereford cattle right now because we're 35 miles from a market where we can get a premium for white face cattle. Um, so we're, there's we're looking at every individual animal and we're trying to market those animals individually. We'll actually take a pin of 100 head of calves. We may market <laughs> those cattle on a on three different marketings. We may sort them three different times, send them to three different places based on what we think we can get the, the premium for that animal. So that, that's what drives us. So when we're looking at calves and we're looking at purchasing calves, we're looking at whether that, that premium on those cattle is going to be greater than the, the discounts. Whether we're going to have a high percentage of number ones and number twos, whether we're going to have a high percentage of primes, high percentage of uh, choice cattle, uh, specific breeds, we can get some premiums for some specific breeds of, on certain different programs, and that's that's what really drives us uh, in in the, in the industry in Iowa. This is the, the the big driver because our volumes are lower. We can't make twenty dollars a head. We have to make more money than that per head to stay in business because so, our margins and our numbers are smaller. So that that's what drives us. So our relationship is, our number one relationship is with the producer, is with you guys because we depend on you to do a lot of things that the commercial people aren't depending on you for and they're not going to pay you more for that calf because you've done these things. We're, we look at the gen, all the way back to the genetics. What, bull are you, what bulls are you buying? What is your cow herd made up of? What's the possibility of those animals genetically bringing a premium? We also look at what your health programs are and, and how you're vaccinating um, and, and the timeliness of your vaccines. We look at the relationship that you have with your vet because uh, that makes a big difference that we see in, in our different programs. If that producer has a direct relationship with a vet, we tend to see healthier cattle coming out of that, that program. So that is the big thing that drives what we do and what you guys do. And these our relationships with our producers tend to be quite long-term. I have... 
um, over the last 40 years, I when we we had a little thing for me a few years ago, a couple of years ago on my 40th, and we went back and looked at all the the cattle that we that we had fed. We had fed cattle out of 27 states, so and we did a couple of thousand producers over the 40 years that I had been there. And some of those relationships were 30 years long. We've been feeding the same the same people's cattle all, over those years. And one thing we do at Gregory Feedlots and through the Tri-County, the group that uh, Emmett was talking about, was we put back a lot of data. We give you guys back a lot of data so that you can use that data to make improvements in what you're doing. You're looking at your different sires, your different cow breeds, your different uh, vaccination programs. We've gone all the way back to looking at different pastures for producers of different grass types of how those cattle are, are doing on different management programs. So we, we offer a lot of that information back and that tends to make our relationships really last because we're getting they're getting some value out of us even though we don't always make money. Uh, you know, in this industry, not every year we're going to make money. But we're giving them some value back so they can look down the road to see where the future is for their relationship in marketing those cattle. The value-added producers tend to look at those cattle and are willing to pay a little more money for them. And I think the last couple of years we've seen that in the marketplace. If you go look at sale barns, and uh, in private tr trades, you'll see that those cattle that have the genetics to be able to produce those premiums and, and are able to show a better health programs and those things, uh, they're bringing a little more money now as, as feeder cattle than they were 20 years ago when the cattle were cattle and they're the same. And I, I think what I'm tr trying to say here is you need to know whether you're producing commodity cattle or you're producing value-added cattle. Because if you're in a commodity business and you're selling cattle and you're not worried about where they're going after they leave your place or what, uh, what they're going to produce, you can't afford to go spend $8,000 for a bull or do all these extra things that are you know, the traceability aspects of the value-added you have to know where you're, where you're at and what your market is so that you can pr produce a financial program that's going to allow you to be profitable. So, and if you're in this business where you're paying more money for genetics, you're doing traceability things, you're keeping track of health records, you're doing all the things that are necessary to produce a calf that can come to the feedlot and do 30% prime and, and bring back $120 a head premiums over the market, then you have to you have to know that you're doing that, and you have to expect to get more money for those cattle. So you have to develop a relationship with someone in this end of the industry that is going to do that. Because the the commodity guys are willing to buy your calves, and they love to have your animal, um, but they're not going to pay you any more for those cattle. They're going to you might top the market that day, but you're not going to be a premium for the product that you're producing. One thing I like to tell my producers is I want to give them back information, enough information that over the long run that they can't afford to sell their calves. They have to own those calves because there's no way for what they're putting into them and the value added on, on the packer into those cattle that they could ever get that without retaining ownership all the way through the feeding program. And we have producers that do that today that they feed their cattle because they know they're going to get a considerable margin over what they could get if they sold them as feeder cattle. So that that's uh, a couple of the things that that we uh, that we work on, um, you know, every day, and 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 that I think that is the the number one thing that you you as producers need to know is what are you producing and what is your market. Can I go out and, and offer these cattle on a value-added market and get a few dollars more ahead for them than I can if I sell them as cattle, as, as feeder cattle? Um, so I think that each one of us needs to sit down and think about where we're at on that end of the scale and, and, and determine what 
what we are producing. Because no matter what you're producing, if you go back to the to this this model, ultimately you're producing for the consumer. And there is a there's great demand for all quality of cattle right now. Uh, we've we've tripled the amount of prime cattle we're producing every year in the country in the last two years. But the premiums for prime are higher now than they were when we were producing two percent. So that that means the consumer is paying more money for that product today than they were when we were producing three times less. So there there is a great demand for that for that product, but. Um, we're looking at, you know, the choice product. I think Cargill announced last week that they're going to come out and they're going to offer a, a restaurant quality product into their grocery store chains. So, which we, you know, we all know that we produce a high pro quality product, but going to the grocery store and finding that product is nearly impossible, even in Iowa where I live. You, you go in there, you don't find the quality of the product that, that we know we're producing. But they're going to introduce that in, into the grocery store lines because there's enough demand for that product that the consumer will pay a little bit of money for that. And so that's where that's going to go. Um, you know, our relationship with our packers, uh, I probably haven't had a, a cattle buyer come on our operation for 10 years. I talked to him on the phone. I sell them all the cattle over the phone because they know what we're producing, and we sort all of our cattle specifically to their to their market. So if they need all black cattle or they need all white faced cattle, they need all choice cattle, we sort the cattle to their market and send them to them. And so our relationship, which is in normally has been very adversarial between the feed the feedlot operator and the packer, is is very tight. We have a, a very good relationship with our packers because they know what we're going to produce for them and what we're going to send to them. And that's a that's another thing in, in the commodity end of the of the business of the feedlot industry. Their main relationship is with with their packer because they have a a contract with the packer, so they have a very tight relationship with that packer. And because it's it's mutually beneficial between the packer and the and the feeder, is the feeder knows when he buys that calf when it's going to go out, and the packer knows when it's going to when it's going to be on his in his plant. So that is a very controlled uh, relationship there, and one of the big things that uh, we've been fighting for. I don't know if any of you have went to the NCBA meetings in. San Antonio this year. Um, one of the one of the big things we've been fighting for for several years now is more price discovery, which means more negotiated trade in the feedlot industry, where we're selling cattle live. We're actually talking to the packer and establishing a price, rather than the formula deals that are between the the big feedlots and the and the packers. So that that's a big issue between. Iowa and, and Texas right now is 60% of the cattle that go out of Iowa are negotiated trade, so all that's reported every day. What what if I make a deal with the packer? It's it's reported, and so you you can look at that or anybody can look at that. But when the when they trade cattle in the south, when they deliver cattle in the south, that's not reported because that's a negotiated, that's a it's a contract, so that's private private business between the the feeder and the packer. So there's there's a big fight going on now to make that information available every day. What is what is cactus feeders or five rivers? What are they getting for their cattle in the industry, which would be more transparent. Um, not that we're gonna know uh, what those individual contracts are, but at least we know what the what they were getting. If they're getting two dollars over if I negotiate trade today for a dollar ninety, and then their contract says I get two dollars more than the Iowa negotiated trade today, we we would like to know that. And that so that, but that's part of that deal in between them, 
And that's a very important part of the cattle feeding industry because without that, the demand for, for feeder cattle would be a lot less because those guys feed a lot of cattle, you know, huge amount of, of cattle that are fed through, through that program. And, and then if you go back to the value added feeders, you know, my main relationship is with the producers. I have a great relationship with the packer, but I have a very important relationship with you because I depend on you to produce the product that I have to have to make money to, to stay in business. So those are some of the things that, that I think that, that you really need to, to look at in your operation and makes, make decisions um, about you know, where you're at and, and what you're doing. Um, you know, like I said, we, we all demand the basic things. We want good, healthy cattle that are going to perform and do well. You guys all know that. You've all known that for 40 years. That's what feedlots want. You know, we want healthy cattle, vaccinated, weaned. We want everything to be perfect. But the thing that has changed is that the commodity market is not going to pay you for the extra inputs that you put into your into your animals to make them have more value. And, and the value added guys aren't going to come back and buy your calves if they don't grade, if we have health problems with them. You know, those are the kind of things. If we can't get a premium for them, we're not going to come back after those calves. Because we have to have a premium to, to make that work. So the, the most important thing for you guys to stay in business is to figure out where you're, what you're marketing for. And I can guarantee you that if you're spending extra money, I, I just talked to a producer in, in Arkansas the other day that spent $12,000 on a bull to put in a commercial herd. And he's asking me if that would pay. So you're sitting there going, not unless you figure out some way to get more for those calves. You know, you've got to you've got to figure that out. So if you're going to put the extra inputs into those cattle, you have to figure out a market to be able to to return that re for you. And you're you're probably not going to get that just taking those calves to to your normal weekly sale barn and selling them. If they have special sales, the livestock marketing people in Iowa have really started doing a lot of special sales. Well, they'll bring those calves in and that have value added and have special sales, those cattle are bringing more money at those sales and, and there, there are people are in there that are buying them for that value added market. So th those, those are the things I got. I don't, know, I don't even know how long I've been talking, but, but uh, uh, I, I, I'm really a lot better at answering questions than I am at talking. So if anybody has any questions, I would certainly answer them on any aspect of the feedlot industry that that you might want to ask, I would Andy, certainly. We, we had some time uh, for question and answer. Okay. Yes. Where your location is with the feedlot? What's your rainfall here? Is the feedlot under cover? We're we're an older lot. The, the question is where we're at, and do we have covered lots, or and and where our weather is like. Uh, we I think we're 37 inches of moisture a year where we're at. Um, we we normally our average snowfall is 18 inches. We're not we're not like northern Iowa that's covered with snow all winter. We're pretty much brown. Um, we're, our lots are old. We've been, I mean, I've been there 40 years, so it was there before I came. Um, so the, we're outside. We have a pretty good slope on our lots to keep the mud down. Um, we're, D, of course, DN, DN, DNR uh, approved. So we have EPA and DNR, the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, monitors what we're doing. Um, so our, our conditions, we can, we can have mud. And we can have winter. Last winter, 43 years I've been doing this. Uh, I told if we had another winter like that this year, I was retiring and I was out of there because we had the worst winter we've ever had. We had we had a kind of a Kentucky Tennessee winter to start with. November, October, November, December, we were in the 40s, and we had 
11 inches of rain in December. So we had mud, knee deep mud, the, that uh, whole time. And then in January, we got extremely cold. It had 54 inches of snow. And then um, February, I, I was just looking at a picture on my phone from uh, February 24th last year where I went down, I was Sunday morning, I was going to feed, help feed. Uh, we had a rain the night before and snow and, and it froze that night. And we had icicles on our front of our silage piles 30, 30 feet high. And we had icicles coming down off of that all the way to the ground as big around as my waist um, on uh, February 24th. So uh, when we looked at yesterday, uh, the, the difference is amazing. So but we had a really tough winter last year, but normally we don't have that. We have pretty, pretty good weather um, as far as condition. Now in, in Iowa, 100% of the expansion in the, in the Iowa cattle industry feeding is uh, inside. It's all confinement barns. Almost all of it now is uh, rubberized slats. We went through the deep bedding barn uh, scenario. We built a lot of those. Uh, Iowa is the only state uh, in the last five years that's actually expanded the feeding, feeding industry in both uh, under, under 1,000 head feedlots and over 5,000 head feedlots. Iowa ha has expanding. And a lot of that is because of this value added added product. We can buy really good cattle. I tell you, we can buy really good cattle everywhere. We can buy, and you know, we feed a lot of cattle out of Florida that are really good cattle that will grade and do the things that we need to do. Uh, so that the, the amount of the cattle that are uh, uh, eligible for those value uh, added markets is increasing and that allows the smaller producers in Iowa, in Illinois, Minnesota, and even in Missouri, there's some expansion. They got a few too many people there, but uh, uh, those those markets are expanding because of the availability of the cattle that we can get premiums for. And we're really fortunate where we're at is we're we got five packers within two hours of us, so you know we have a really good market for the for the cattle. Hey, I'm going to take. Uh Moderator, I wish I knew what those solutions were. Yeah. Uh, price discovery is, is super complicated because none of us want to be told what to do. None of us want to be told how we're going to sell our cattle. Okay, we just don't want anybody telling us that. So in my area, in Iowa, we like uh, three years ago, we went to NCBA and introduced a policy that we, we would make it mandatory that 50% of the cattle were sold in a price negotiated trade, which would mean that 50% of the cattle in the country, 50% of yours, 50% of mine, 50% of everybody's had to be sold on a negotiated trade, which means we had to talk to the buyer and establish a price for the cattle that day. So that was a big demand because in Iowa that's easy because 60% of the cattle are sold that way. In eastern Nebraska, it's over 60% of the cattle are sold that way. You go to western Nebraska, it's, it's much less. You go to Texas, uh, I think last year they were somewhere around 2%. 2% of their cattle actually had a price. The rest of them were all on contracts. They were all uh, packer feedlot uh, agreements, and those cattle were delivered, and no one knows what that price was except the packer and the, and the uh, producer. So... The, the big issue is, is why are the producers in Iowa establishing the price for fat cattle for everybody, which ultimately affects you guys because that determines the feeder cat prices. So uh, there's, there, there's been different things trying to get to the point where there's more trade, trade availability, you know, information, 
Um, and so one of the things that was passed was this, uh, the cattle that are, that are traded on contracts, that information is available, but it's delayed, and it's very convoluted when you look at it. If you look at the, at the trade on the USDA marketing reporting stuff, that information is on there, but it might be a month old. And what they proposed this time, and it passed, which was a miracle that it passed when, you're, when Texas, Kansas, Colorado can control most of the voting delegates. Um, it did pass uh, that they're going to look at, the USDA still has to approve it, but the NCA is going to push it, that those contract trades will re be reported that day. Whatever the packer kills, they get those cattle in. Whatever they're paying for those cattle will show up uh, right along with the negotiated trade. So you will know that if the cattle in Texas are bringing $2 more than the cattle in Iowa. So that, that is some of it. There's been a lot of things tested, but even when, 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 when I was carrying them to the NCBA uh, for the Iowa cattlemen, there were some things that, that I didn't like because I don't want someone telling me how to do my business. If I can make more money negotiating a contract with a packer, I want to be able to do that. But I can also see the other side where where you're a small producer isn't going to be able to do that. and They need to know what the market is. Emmett? To what extent do you see uh, integration of feed lots back into the stocker business? Yeah, it's, it's happening. The bigger, the bigger producers or bigger feedlots are, are doing it. They've done it for a long time. Adam's Adams Land and Cattle out of uh, Broken Bone, Nebraska has had a very complicated network of growers throughout the Midwest bringing cattle in and growing them for them and that, so that their feedlot, they never want to miss a day. If you've got a 200 head pin, you want that pin to be full of cattle, 200 head every day. And uh, that's very important to their business model. And they have to sustain that. But, you know, I, I, I hate to be Sonny Purdue and get up in Minnesota and tell uh, the dairy people that uh, if you're not going to grow, you're probably going to get put out of business. Uh, but there is going to be uh, more types of integration in the industry as long as our margins are so small. If, if, I, what I say, you know, I, we were in, we're in the hog business also in our operation, and I saw the, the sows go away, the, the reproductive herds in, in Iowa go away, and everybody says, well, that's because, you know, the big companies got into it and they could afford um, to spend more money on it. But what I say is that if I'm profitable, no one's going to put me out of business. If I have 20 cows and I'm making money doing it, I am not going to be put out of business. I'm going to keep my cows. So the, the number one thing about sustainability, if you want to talk about that, is profitability. If you're making money, you're not going to go out of business. You're not going to let someone put you out of business. Because we, have, we all in this room have a passion for what we do. We, I mean, I, I have a pretty thick skin anymore. I can get... People tell me that I did a lousy job, and, and I've heard it all over the years. But um, I do this because I love what I'm doing. I, I, I feed cattle because it's, it's in my blood, I guess. But if we can make money, we, we won't have vertical integration because we will stay in business. So that's why it's so important to me over the, over the last 10 years that I've seen is, is whether we can make money. We can talk about 100% prime cattle. We can talk about Angus cattle. We can talk about Herbert cattle. We can talk about a lot of different things. But none of that makes any difference if we're not making any money. We, got, we, we have to make money. So 
that's what I want you guys to get from what I'm talking today is you need to figure out where your market is so that you can be profitable so that <coughs> it probably won't be 10 years when I come back, but uh, 10 years from now, uh, your operation's still going and, and making money and and uh, we're not, we don't see the vertical integration that we normally, we've seen in the hog industry and the chicken industry. Yes? You mean on the fat side or the? Yeah, yeah marbling and fat and kind of the. I tell you, the, the there's a lot of technology coming. There's a lot of technology. I, I've been talking to an outfit out of Iowa right now that wants to put an X-ray machine in your in your uh, chute going up to your handling facility, and then when that calf walks through there, it'll take an X-ray of that lung and tell you whether that calf has pneumonia or has any lung damage. And they're, they're willing to do that for $2 a head. And they're working on the technology to do that right now. So there's, you know, there's amazing how much stuff that you, you, that you got. So. One last question. Well, the last four years, we've been almost 100%. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'll tell you what, we, we charge 15 cents a head a day. Uh, that's a yardage. And then we, we mark up the feed $19 a ton. <coughs> we use uh, dry rolled corn, high moisture corn, uh, alfalfa hay, uh, some silage, um, of course a supplement. And we put those in, at, we mark them up just enough to cover our shrink, which is like 1%. And then we put $19 a ton on that ration when it goes to the bunk. So if your cattle are eating you know, like normal consumption of like 36 pounds a day, your cost, your, my, my net that I'm going to bring in is somewhere in the mid-50s. It would be 55 to 57, depending on if they're eating 30 pounds or they're eating 40 pounds. And then we have a $1 shoot charge for every time that calf goes through the shoot, we get charge $1. And that's it. Uh, we don't mark up the medicine. We don't mark up anything. And, and we're kind of unique, and Emmett can tell you this, that uh, uh, as a small feedlot, we have a contract with a, with a local vet clinic. We don't have a needle or a bottle of medicine on our operation. All, this, all of our medicine and our treatments come from a vet. They, they come up. We, uh, we autops, autopsy every calf that's, that dies. So we have a vet that diagnoses everything on every calf. And uh, we have a contract with them for so much a CC uh, for the products. So I get to share that every day. So <laughs> whatever, whatever it is. Do this uh, through the Tri-County Secure Charge Security, the closeouts and the amount of data you get from your system. Rarely ever do you kind of work that into the system state. Rarely ever do you miss on target data. I really appreciate you being here today. Oh, thank it's, you. Uh, thank you. Dr. Rollins, you make your way up. I want to have Dr. Rollins have a nice lesson. Thank you.